Good morning, and isn't it good to be together again? It may be a cold morning, but we can be here and dig into God's Word today. And in fact, today we do a deep dive into Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is part story and part theology. And so today we are going to talk about the problem with unicorns. It may sound a little strange, but bear with me because we are going to find out what this is about. So unicorns are a legendary horse-like beast with a single horn. And they are so rare that you will never meet one. They are a statistical anomaly, if you, if you want to put it that way. Now, unicorns are not just creatures of myth and legend. They've actually... Well, they haven't changed, but the way we've used the term has changed. And it was in 2013 that Eileen Lee, who is a venture capitalist, coined a new definition for unicorn. So she said that a unicorn is a privately held startup company valued at over $1 billion. And she said that is so statistically rare that she called it a unicorn and that's kind of stuck. And so ever since um, 2013, these privately held, typically tech companies, startup companies that are valued at over a billion dollars are now labeled as unicorns. And that kind of has spread. So, you know, unicorns hold enormous potential when we talk business, but they also come with big risk because these unicorns, without having a strong corporate culture um, or a good structure, face significant hurdles. And the hurdles will be many. So how does this connect to the church? Well, the church in Acts chapter 15, in fact, the church in the whole book of Acts, could be described as a statistical rarity, a unicorn, a a group of people, a movement, a religious movement in history that ends up being a disruptive force, a disruptive force that changes the world. Now, it's a moment of high risk as we come here into Acts chapter 15, but it's also amazing opportunity. Today, we reach the centre of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15, by word count, if you count either way, is pretty much smack bang in the middle of the book of Acts. So from here, Peter now fades from the the, the story. He really doesn't feature again. And Jerusalem also, it, it features again, but its significant fades. And so the focus now moves from, from Jerusalem and Peter to the rest of the world and the spread of the gospel to the rest of the world. So if we just take a step back and remember, the Christian church starts in Acts chapter 1 with about 120 believers gathered together there in the upper room. They are in an insignificant part of the Roman Empire and just a small group of insignificant people. And it could have been that in the the world in which they lived that Christianity could have just become an insignificant subset, you know, this little sect of Judaism that never really developed beyond that. But now you have in Acts these multiple thousands that are pouring into the church and becoming Christians, not just Jews, but now big numbers of Gentiles. And that's where the challenge comes. This is genuinely dramatic stuff. And so as they think through it, the, as we think through it, we realize here that the church is well and truly on track to becoming a disruptor, a unicorn, if we use that business terminology, because it is transforming into a global movement that impacts both Jews and Gentiles. And so like the billion dollar startup that disrupts the status quo, the world is now on notice. But sudden and explosive growth, which is what's happening, brings challenges. And the question is, how will the church respond to the challenge? And if we think about it further, 
if our church was to grow by thousands, would we be ready? How would we respond? And this is the same dilemma they face back there. In some ways, the dilemma is bigger because we do have a broader system of, of you know, structure and all that comes with that. Back then, it's all just beginning. It's all at the start. So by Acts chapter 15, Paul's first missionary journey, which we've heard about previously, is done. And it's a notable success. Many people are joining the church. It's Jews, it's God-fearers, it's Gentiles, those from completely pagan backgrounds. And so the question of Acts 15 is how is the church going to respond? So bear with us, pull your, you know, get your Bibles out, come in a bit closer because we are going to do a genuine deep dive into a bit of theology as we go through Acts 15. So here's how it starts out at the beginning of the book, uh, of the chapter. Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, it's a bit rugged when you think about it, but here are Paul and Barnabas in Antioch. This is the Antioch in Syria because there were two of them. And in Antioch in, in Syria trouble is brewing and so it ends up in this quite sharp dispute as it as it describes it in the following verses there you've got Paul and Barnabas being the 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 ones that are standing up against this party of the Pharisees as they're described or as some call them they are these Judaizers and so what we pretty quickly see as we progress through these verses is that it's not actually about or not primarily even about circumcision. That's the presenting issue. Uh, but they've got bigger fish that they're trying to fry, if we can use the, that sort of terminology. So Paul and Barnabas are representatives or become, they're appointed as representatives of the church in Antioch and they head for Jerusalem. And so by the time we come to verse 5, we see this. And it says there, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, those Judaizers, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised. So they've already said that before, but now that they're in Jerusalem, they're adding more to the sentence. The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Well, this now puts a whole different spin on everything because what they are saying in essence is that to become a Christian, you first have to become a Jew. And that means everything down to, take a breath, circumcision, as they've said it. And so as Jerusalem meets, they're in this council. Now, the council is is more than a discussion, but probably less than what we would call a global general conference. They, They come together to find common direction but there's no hint of binding votes or anything like that. They, they you know, come to a point of decision, which we will see. And Acts 15 is really just a summary of what was obviously a much longer discussion. And so Luke doesn't present the case for circumcision. In fact, as we'll note as, again as we go through, circumcision, circumcision is mentioned early here, but then it's not even named again as we go through the chapter. So what would their argument have been? Um, You know, maybe one of the arguments would have been that circumcision goes all the way back to Abraham and predates even the law of Moses. And so if we if we are serious about walking in the footsteps of those who have come before us, then you should be circumcised. You can see how the argument would go. Maybe also there'd be an argument that says, look, circumcision provides a clear and simple distinction full stop clear and simple yes painless no anyway we won't get stuck on that maybe also they might have said that circumcision has been required of those coming into judaism forever that's why they already have a distinction between true jews and god fearers And then, of course, you've got the the whole thing, that it was a sign of the covenant between God and his people. And if they 
had circumcision as part of it, it would actually make evangelizing the Jews easier. Anyway, that's just a bit of a flavor of what their arguments might have been. Now, that one ignores the fact that in the Old Testament, God had already said what he desired was circumcision of the heart. So he was looking for something that made an internal change. What's interesting here in Acts 15 is there's no argument about Gentiles joining the church. That is accepted by all. That matter is settled. The issue is not about Gentiles joining the church. The issue that is not settled is how do we include Gentiles? Not if, how. And so, you know, how do we go about living together and eating and worshipping together when they all come from such dramatically different backgrounds. And so we come to Peter's speech. Peter is not the most prominent person here in the Jerusalem Council. That role we really have to give to James. But Peter is the, the first to stand up and speak. He, he is influential. So in Acts chapter 15 and verse, um, verse 5, no, let's go to verse 7. Peter said, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. So the gospel is at the foundation of it here. Verse 8, God knows, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. Now, this is the third mention of Cornelius and the, the encounter that Peter has with Cornelius in Acts. And we're only up to chapter 15. But what Peter is really wanting to emphasize here is this inclusion of the Gentiles into the church. This is God's choice. And so in a sense, you can almost imagine Peter. This is my imagination anyway. You might imagine it differently. But, you know, a bit of a shrug of the shoulders and, and the hands in the air and just saying, look, this is God's doing. Don't blame me. Um, I'm sure he didn't say it quite like that. But let's come to the, the, the next verse um, there in verse 9. Peter says, He, God, did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now he says then, Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Now, it's a great point. Um, and again, he's coming back to that sense of, you know, testing God on this is his way of saying, God has settled the matter. God has decided. Don't fight with God over what he has decided. Um, and also, don't put a yoke on them. And a yoke here is not necessarily a bad thing. A yoke is what holds the church together, holds the oxen together um, in that sense. But what he's saying here is, this actually hasn't worked for, for the Jews. Why would we now take that and put that on the Gentiles as well? So we, we keep reading. We've got another verse here that we want to pick up on. And this is a beautiful verse. This is one of the critical, um, I guess, themes that comes through in this chapter. Acts chapter 15 and verse 11. Peter says, no, talking about the yoke. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. In other words, whether Jew or Gentile, we are all saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the bedrock, the fundamental foundation on which the church um, is based. And so what's described there now in Acts is that silence descends on, on the group. You know, Peter has said something that they, they, they've got to think about this. And now Paul and Barnabas step up. But it's interesting because it, it reverses it. Leading into this, it's Paul and Barnabas. Now it's Barnabas and Paul because Barnabas takes more prominence than Paul when it comes to meeting with all the Jews or the Jewish background Christians in Jerusalem. And so they share stories of how God has been working through them with the Gentiles and with others and they're stories that aren't repeated in Acts 15 because we've just been reading it in the chapters leading up to it. And so after Paul and Barnabas, you can imagine um, after much discussion, James, 
finally stro- you know, strides to, to the podium. James is the brother of Jesus. He was late to the party of the disciples. He was the one who became known as James the Just, the one who, not that far down the track, is to become a martyr for his faith. And perhaps the Pharisee party have, have kind of concluded because of James' Jewish background and his place in Jerusalem that he's going to support their ideas. Maybe the appeal has been to, to him. And so James, his words carry weight with all parties there in that meeting. And let's have a look at what James says. And, and this is from James 15 verse 13. James said, brothers... Listen to me. Simon, Peter that is, has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. So it's a repetition of what Peter has said. God has chosen a people from the Gentiles. It's not just about the Jews. The words, verse 16, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. And he quotes from Amos, after this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, and he's coming now to the the, the crux of the matter. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Another translation says we should not place burdens on the Gentiles who are turning to God. We shouldn't make it harder. And here it is. Here's the crux of the matter. Instead, he says we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. And finally, he says, for the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. And that's the end of James' speech. And his speech settles it. That's it. Gentiles joining the church, he's saying, is not an anomaly. It was foreseen by God. It is a fulfillment, if you like, of prophecy. God has promised it would happen, and now it is. So be happy. Get on board. But then he gets to the crux of it. Let's not place unnecessary burdens on those seeking to join the church. And so the agreement that he brings to that group of people on that day through the Holy Spirit is that he is able to see the bigger picture and discern God's hand in it all. He leads the church to respond appropriately. And and as I said, clearly the discussion moved on from circumcision pretty quickly because there is no more mention of it. Or maybe they just don't want to talk about that aspect of it. And so his solution is very clear, very straightforward. A letter is sent out to to particularly the church in Antioch, but other churches as well. And from verse 23, it's essentially a repetition and an elaboration on what we've just read. And so the, the, the prohibitions boil down to, number one, no food offered to idols. Number two, no sexual immorality. Number three, no meat from strangled animals. And number four, no blood. We'll come back to that. But why these particular prohibitions? You know, Acts simply says this stuff's been preached in the synagogue since forever. Um, we don't want to place excessive burdens on them. But it doesn't explain it beyond that. So why these four? First place we go looking. Is it the Ten Commandments? Well, Ten Commandments covers the sexual immorality one, but not the others. Is it from the law of Moses? Trouble is, if you go looking in the law of Moses, there's nothing about eating the meat from strangled animals. If you go to further back to the covenant with Noah, it does talk about the prohibition on blood, but none of the others. Now, some go a little further and say, well, perhaps it's an exercise in cultural, you know, cross-cultural sensitivity. 
you know, give a bit of ground from the Jews and a bit of ground from the Gentiles, find that common ground in the middle so that we don't stomp on the conscience of any one group, but enable them to come together again to eat together and worship together and live together. And maybe there's an element of that here. We shouldn't say there's none of that here, but it still doesn't explain all four of the prohibitions. And it was while searching for an answer on this that I came across, of all things, a 500-page doctoral thesis. I'm not going to give the whole lot to you. You can relax. But to understand the four prohibitions, we need to go back to Genesis, the entrance of sin, creation. In Genesis, chapters 1 to 3, you have three themes that emerge. And I'll just touch on these quickly. So the first one is true worship versus idolatry. You know, in the original battle in Genesis, we, humanity, are created in his, God's image, and the snake sets out to change all that. And in Genesis 1 to 3, we will either worship God and obey him as he wants, or we will be drawn into something else, which ends up being idolatry. So it's true worship versus idolatry on the one hand. Second theme that comes through is that of life versus death. In Genesis, God is the author of life. He is the one that has the ability to give and to take life. He's the one that takes the dust of the earth and breathes the breath into it after fashioning it into a man and it becomes a living being. And so then when sin comes in and death comes in, creation reverses. And as that, happened, blood, as that happens, blood returns to dust, breath returns to God. And so when they eat the forbidden fruit, they are barred from the garden. And so food can be a life and death issue in this story because it expresses greater realities, the struggle between life and death. Third theme that comes through is that of modesty versus what we call fornication. Bit of an old fashioned word, but um, one that we do understand mostly. So when sin enters the world, Adam and Eve live in, up until that point, in this state of perfection. But when sin comes in, what do they realize? Suddenly they realize that they are naked. And so what we see here is their perception is distorted by sin. And everything from nakedness to sexuality becomes twisted and they, they fruitlessly try to cover their nakedness with leaves. Instead, God comes to them and covers their nakedness with garments of skin. And it hints at the robe that he will one day provide for us so that we can stand perfect before Jesus. So now let's bring that back and connect it to the four prohibitions. So let's just bring these four prohibitions back and I'll have them on the screen there to remind you. So the firstly, the, the food, no food polluted to idols, um, offered to idols, polluted by idols. Um, in Genesis, the snake suggested that a particular food could make them like God. It's a true worship versus idolatry showdown. See, Meat in ancient times often came via pagan temples. There was a great excess and it would go out into the marketplace and it would be sold in the markets. And so to buy and eat food offered to idols supported the whole pagan system and opened the door to involvement in pagan worship. Abstaining from food offered to idols helped maintain true worship as a new creation in Christ they were now free to worship God as he intended. So you see those two aspects, both paganism that it has a connection to, but also back to Genesis and the whole true worship versus idolatry challenge. Now, the second one is the no sexual immorality. In Genesis, when they sin, they realize they're naked. God comes along and clothes Adam and Eve and their nakedness was not to be uncovered outside of that marriage relationship. And so for Christians, modesty mattered as it protected their marriages from unfaithfulness, nakedness, 
um, so to say, but unfaithfulness and the temptation of pagan worship. And when you think about pagan worship in that time, it contains these ecstatic experiences, nakedness and sexual immorality. And so it was about protecting them from being drawn away from God. To be a new creation meant to love as God intended. Then the third one is the meat from strangled animals. Now in Genesis, um, not only was food used to induce sin, but when God created people and creatures, their breath came from God and belonged to God. And so at the moment of death, the breath returned to God, the giver of life, the one to whom it belonged. And so getting down into the nitty gritty of it, to strangle an animal meant that final breath was not able to be released and returned to God. So not only was it, you know, taking life in that sense, but it also was about taking the role of God over life and death. And so this, this connection with creation also connects to pagan worship because it was about having people step into the place of God in matters of life and death. And that was pagan in both practice and thought. And so the prohibition here is about protecting and upholding the sanctity of life and to be a new creation in Christ meant to be free to live as God intended. And then we've got this fourth one, this no blood thing. And it says um, with, with this one that, you know, well, let, let's take it back this way. We remember that life is indicated by blood flowing in our veins and our breath. When either stop, we die, we're done. And in Genesis, we, we read of the blood of the murdered Abel crying out from the ground for justice. Slaughtered animals, the blood was allowed to run out onto the dust. Dust would be covered over, the, you know, used to cover over the blood. And it would signify that the blood had gone back and was now in the hands of God. You know, the, the creator, the one who had power over that. So the blood indicated sacredness of life and to abstain from it was to abstain um, from, I guess, how do we put this? Um, it was to abstain from taking life that wasn't yours to take. It was to uphold the sanctity of life. It was also to avoid all those aspects of pagan worship that also in, uh, you know, involved blood. And so as a new creation, Christians were free to live and to let others live as God intended. It was about this freedom that now came. And it was a good outcome. The unicorn church, this disruptive church, was now set free from excessive rules and regulations and burdens on those coming to faith in Jesus. These prohibitions signaled the early church's desire to go right back to the original template that God intended. In this new creation, true worship would not be overcome by idolatry. Life would be deliberately upheld over death and modesty and purity would be prized over lust, immorality and nakedness. Now they were free to worship as God intended, to love as God intended and to live as he intended and to be protected against the wiles of paganism. And so the church sends two witnesses off to Antioch and beyond with a letter, Judas and Silas. Um, as they go off to Antioch, they share it there, they preach, they teach along with Paul and Barnabas and the church is built up and strengthened. It is now free to go to the furthest corners of the Roman Empire and even beyond to share the good news with Jews and God-fearers and Gentiles, Gentiles that were the pagan of pagans. But it didn't solve everything. It's kind of sad in a way because in Acts 21, the Jews are still suspicious of Paul. 
but we're going to keep that story for another day. Acts 15 highlights that while the purity of the gospel cannot be compromised, there is a place in the church from people of every background. Now, if we ended here, we've got just a couple of more minutes, but if we ended here and we could, we would have mentioned unicorns and have pretty much a happy ending. But it's not to be because another challenge arises and as so often happens in life, after something good, after a high, after a coming together, well, there's another challenge. Acts chapter 15. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And so this is what happens. This is an abbreviation of it. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and went to Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. The argument they have here is just gut-wrenching, to put it in those terms. They are both right in their own way, and they don't and won't give ground. And so they split. The chasm is deep and wide, and Paul and Barnabas never work together again. It's kind of sad. And Luke could have ignored this and just left it out, and we'd never know about it, but he didn't. Paul and Barnabas could have blown up the church at this point, but they don't. Instead, they go their separate ways, but they multiply their mission teams and the gospel goes further and faster. A negative comes to be used for good. And God still is looking to use bad, perhaps like pandemics, for good if we're willing. And so I've got five quick takeouts And as we think about what do we learn from this, there's just a handful of things and many others, I'm sure. Number one, disagreements don't always have perfect solutions. Yes, even in the church. And so the Jerusalem Council, they didn't satisfy everyone. Paul and Barnabas didn't solve everything. But God works through it. And what it tells us is we will have differences, but mature Christians find ways to move forward with God. Number two, God, in, uh, God, God, well, God does sometimes introduce complication. Growth, in this case, introduces complication. It's how we respond that matters. Number three, poor culture can kill a unicorn. That's what they say in business. Getting the culture right here was important. God directed that process and he set the church free to grow and nor should we as they didn't then place unnecessary burdens on those wishing to join the church and then we come to number two we haven't quite got to the most important this is the penultimate one God's original plan is still best in Genesis we were created to live free as God did as God intended in true worship upholding the sanctity of life and seeking healthy relationships to be free, to worship, to live and to love. And here's where we finish. Number one, the most important thing we find in Acts chapter 15, salvation by grace, salvation by grace comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the bedrock on which the church is and must be built. And so as we reflect on Acts 15, we've done a theological deep dive, but it comes down to salvation by grace grace through faith in Jesus Christ is the bedrock on which our church and us must all be built. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the message of Acts chapter 15. There's so much in this chapter and we, we see how it goes all the way back there to Genesis to remind us that we are free to worship, to live and to love as you intended. And it's all based on the bedrock of salvation by faith through grace in Jesus. And Lord, help that to be the non-negotiable. Help us to reflect you in all that we do. And so may your blessing be upon us as we go through the rest of this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.